Hello, I'd like to thank the Barrington Area Library for hosting me today. Um, thank you for joining us today. We're going to be going over some basic bicycle maintenance that you need to do before you put your bicycle away this winter. Hopefully we'll have plenty more days this season uh, where we can get out and enjoy our bicycles, but we're going to go over some stuff you need to do before you put your bicycle away um, for the winter. Thank you again for joining us. Putting your bike to bed. Well, first of all, let's take a look at this bike. Take a few moments, have a look at this bike and see if you can see what is wrong with this bicycle. Well, other than it just being plain old, let's see. First of all, there's no reflectors on this bike. And there's lots of dirt and lots of corrosion. Lots of dirt and lots of corrosion. Also, these tires are badly dry rotted. You can see as I'm pressing down on this tire, you can see the cracks inside this. There's every possibility that if this tire was fully inflated to its proper pressure, that it, it could come apart and fail while you're riding. So these tires definitely need to be replaced. So let's get started on getting this bike all repaired. Now this is a coaster brake bike. So first step is going to be dismantling this coaster brake arm. Simply pull that screw out. Now we need to remove the wheel. And when you're working on a bicycle or, or any mechanical device, it's very important to use the right size wrench. And when you look at this axle nut, you can see that someone at some point in this bicycle's lifetime has used um, the incorrect size wrench on this fastener and has rounded it off. May have been done with a, um, an adjustable wrench that came loose or just was simply a wrench that was too big. Now, if you need to remove the chain, you need to find your master link. This is going to be the one link in the chain that looks different. Now, there are several different types of master links. Some just have a snap ring that holds them together. You pry off the snap ring and it comes right apart. Um, this particular master link needs a press to remove one of the pins to get it apart. Now, if you look at your, your chain very carefully and you see no discernible difference in any of the links, that means you can just select pretty much any link in the chain and it'll come apart exactly like this. But first look for a link that looks different and that's going to be your master link and that's the one you want to focus on taking apart if you need to remove the chain. Now this handy tool is available at my local library in a little toolkit with all kinds of um, specialty tools for working on bicycles and this little pin press will push the pin right out of the master link and it comes apart really easily. Now one thing I want to mention is that when you're working on bicycles you you're going to encounter some left-handed threads on the pedals and on the cranks. Any type of fasteners um, where the torque can make them where the regular use will make them come apart, they often use left-handed threads. Now they always use left-handed threads on the left side of bicycles, on the pedals, um, and, and the, the fasteners that hold the crank bearings together. Um, this is because during normal operation, the regular torque could loosen a right-handed standard fastener. Um, now, basically, I'm sure if you've worked on any mechanical things, you've heard the old phrase, lefty, loosey, righty, tighty. Now, when you encounter left-handed threads, it's simply the opposite. Um, and instead of lefty, loosey, righty, tighty, it's exactly the opposite. You turn it to the right to loosen it and the left to tighten it.
So you need to be aware of that. On the left-hand side of the bike, the pedals and the crank um, fasteners are going to be left-handed threads. Now these are the crank bearings off of this bicycle. And this bike was neglected for so long that the grease was no longer a lubricant. It was actually very sticky and dirty. And um, what made the cranks and everything on this bicycle was like this, uh, made everything difficult to turn. But the bearings themselves are actually in surprisingly good shape. They just need a good cleaning and re-greasing and they'll function perfectly. Now I need to remove the handlebars and the neck on this bicycle. Now the first step is to loosen the neck bolt. Doesn't need to be loosened very much, doesn't need to be removed all the way, just loosen oh, about three-eighths of an inch or so. And then I give it a tap with a hammer. And you can see the whole piece has fallen down into the fork tube. So it's loose and now I can remove it. Now this is a stem expander bolt. And this is why I had to tap that bolt down. Basically, there's two pieces that have wedge shapes machined into them. The nut on this bolt has one wedge and then the neck has another wedge. And as you tighten these things up, they expand and grip the inside of the fork tube. And if you, you could remove that long bolt completely and these two pieces could still be wedged together and it could still be impossible to remove the, um, the neck. That's why you give it a little tap down, it comes loose. Every bicycle I've worked on has something like this holding the neck on. Now these are the headset bearings. They're the bearings that make the front fork turn easily. And they, just like the crank bearings, the grease had become sticky and dirty and needed to be cleaned off and re-greased. But the bearings themselves were in surprisingly good shape. Now hopefully, and most likely, your bicycle is not going to be in this bad a shape when you go to put it away this winter. Um, hopefully you won't need to do nearly this much. Also wanted to point out, these are the axle bearings off of this bicycle. And just like the rest of the bearings, so the grease had become so sticky um, that you just had to take it apart and clean these and re-grease them. Fortunately, these are all caged bearings and they are super easy to work with. Um, when you have loose bearings, uh, th that can that's a completely different story and can be really difficult to, um, to, to get them clean and re-greased and reinstalled. Um, some bicycles have sealed bearings, and if they go bad, there's not much you can do to um, clean and repair them. So they just need to be replaced. But th these are super easy to clean, re-grease, and function just as good as new. Also need to clean the hubs out on this bicycle. There's some corrosion, and that sticky grease is in there too. All of that needs to be cleaned out. And now I'm removing the tires. Now, when you're working on bicycle tires, you may have a flat tip screwdriver around and it's tempting to just pry the tire off with those. Don't do it. Use these plastic tools. They're very, very inexpensive. This particular set here came in that kit that I checked out from my library, but you can go down to your local bicycle shop and purchase a set for about $3 and they will save you endless headaches. Um, if you try to use a metal tool to pry off the tires, you're going to scrape up your rims. Uh, you can pinch the inner tube and, and just cause all kinds of damage and problems for yourself. So just get a set of these plastic tire removal tools, very inexpensive and very well worth the investment. Now these are the wheels from this bicycle. If you look at the one in the back, it's all clean and shiny, and the one in the front still has all kinds of surface rust on them. Um, it was very easy, actually, to get these cleaned up and looking nice using a product called Quadruple Zero Steel Wool. Now, if you're going to be polishing any metal surfaces or chrome, make sure you use Quadruple Zero. That's four zeros. If you grab like an SOS pad or a piece of coarse steel wool, 
you will scuff and dull any metal that you're working on and you can also open it up and make it corrode faster um, but you definitely don't want to use anything but quadruple zero steel wool for doing this kind of polishing um, it's available at any hardware store or home center but just make sure it has four zeros not three or anything else four zeros Now I've got these bearings and bearing cups cleaned, degreased, and all polished up and ready to be re-lubricated. And you can see there right in the pan I have a piece of quadruple zero steel wool that I was using to polish things with. Now I'm reseeding these bearing cups. They're kind of a press fit, but not the kind of press fit where you need an arbor press or anything to put them in. Um, removing them was very easy. I used a very large flat tip screwdriver and tapped them out from the opposite side that I'm showing here in this picture. And tapping them back in is just as easy, but I don't want to use any kind of metal against metal to tap these back in. So I'm setting the, the frame onto an old two by four and then taking a piece of one by and tapping these pieces in. Just want to make sure because if you if you hit them directly with a hammer, you can ding them and cause them to basically destroy the the bearings and cause all kinds of problems. And it's very simple. Just grab a scrap, couple scrap pieces of wood, and and uh, tap them together like this. Now I'm putting those headset bearings back in. They're greased and ready to go. Same thing with the crank bearings. Um, you can see I've got all of this stuff. I'm sure you noticed all the corrosion on this before. I've got it all cleaned and polished up and greased up with just plain old red grease from my hardware store. Now this type of crank is called a one piece crank. Um, meaning basically there's just one piece that uh, attaches the pedals and the center axle of your cranks. A lot of more modern bikes have what they call three-piece cranks and you need a special puller to remove those and um, actually in this photograph in the back I see the um, toolkit that I checked out from my local library and it has a puller in there for removing three-piece cranks. Um, if your your local library doesn't have something like this you can check out when you're working on a bike with three-piece cranks um, run down to your local bike shop and get the proper puller for it and um, not an expensive tool but it is something if you're going to be removing three-piece cranks you're gonna need it to pull off the cranks now I'm putting new tires but believe it or not I'm putting back I'm reinstalling the same old inner tubes that are removed from these tires um, despite the fact that the tires were just completely useless and shot the inner tubes were in fine condition a lot of what deteriorates uh, rubber products is uh, UV light and this particular bike had been sitting outside for many years exposed to all kinds of weather and it destroyed the tires but since the inner tubes were encased in those tires they were in fine condition they had no leaks um, so I was able to reinstall them so it was a very good thing that I was extra careful in removing the tires because then I was able to just reuse the inner tubes and save myself some money but once again don't use any type of metal tool to reinstall your tire um, getting the the first side on is super easy then you stick the tube in there then you, you get around to the end and you, you it gets very tight these tools make it super easy to pop that last bit of the bead on and they're plastic so they won't pinch anything they won't scratch anything um, and you definitely don't want to pinch your inner tube and then have to take everything off and start all over again now I thought this was a clever safety feature on this old bicycle these washers on the front wheel actually hook into a small hole on the fork and what that does if the axle bolts um, axle nuts I should say come loose on the axle bolt your front tire is not just going to immediately fall off it'll be wobbly and you should notice it before it comes in danger of actually falling off and making you eat asphalt 
Um, clever safety feature on this old bike. And I point this out because it's very important as you're disassembling a bike to make sure that you know how all the parts are going to go back in. If you look at this washer, it would be very easy to change the orientation on it so that it didn't grab that little hole. I could have put it on upside down. I could have it facing out instead of in so it didn't catch that hole. And it would defeat the purpose of this safety feature. So be aware of everything on your bicycle, what its function is, and how it's going to go back together before you start taking it apart or as you're taking it apart. Um, you just want to make sure everything goes back exactly as it came off of the bike and everything's properly installed and you don't defeat any of the safety features of your bicycle. Now for a moment I thought I was all done, but if you look at this bike, can you see what I forgot? I forgot the chain guard. I had set it off somewhere and um, I point that out because it's very important when you're done with a project like this to go over it again and make sure you didn't forget anything. Now if you look at the bike, everything's reinstalled, everything is cleaned, lubricated, and waxed. Um, I've got great big reflectors on those wheels, going to give me some really good night visibility. Um, reflectors front and rear on the bike. This bike is ready to roll. But I'm going to go back and I'm going to check every single fastener. This bike was completely disassembled. I need to double check everything on this bike. And this is something you should do when you're putting your bike away for the season and probably several times through the season. Just go over and make sure nothing's coming loose. Just get your wrenches out. It's a good time to make sure you have the proper size wrench for every fastener. Make sure none of your wrenches are wobbly on those fasteners and just tighten everything up. Make sure nothing's come loose. Next, I'm going to check the tire pressure. The recommended tire pressure will be embossed on the side of the tire. Every tire has the pressure embossed on the side. You want to be careful. You don't have to fill it if the tire pressure says 50 pounds. It doesn't have to stay right at 50 pounds. You may want to go a little bit under that, but that is the maximum you're going to want to fill that tire up to. You don't want to go over the recommended tire pressure. Being under if it's far under, that can cause you wear problems, but you never ever want to go over. That can cause you big problems. Here's some photographs showing the recommended tire pressure on these two bikes. The white wall tire, it's really easy to see that this is supposed to be inflated to 40 PSI. The gum wall tire here, it's a little bit harder to see that 75 right there. But you can see there's a huge range that tires can be. So you want to make sure you look at your tire and see what the proper pressure is. It can be anything from 30 PSI to 100 PSI. And you want to be very careful that you have it filled to the proper recommended pressure. I also highly recommend that you buy a good quality bike pump. Using an air compressor, I've seen people explode tires. Um, you, you need to be very careful when you're filling up a bicycle tire. If you're using a compressor, it's very easy to over inflate the tire. This particular bike pump I purchased probably 20 years ago, and it has been functioning great for me for two decades. It has its own pressure gauge built right in. It's a very, very handy thing to have when you're working on a bicycle. And now I wanna find a safe place to put the bike away for the winter. Um, here I have just some standard hooks that I purchased at a home center, uh, screwed into the studs, um, the, the joist I should say, not the studs, in the ceiling of my garage. Um, you don't want to just screw them into the drywall. It'll fall out and land on your car. Um, 
you want to find the studs and make sure that uh, these hooks are whatever device you use for getting your bike up out of the way in a safe place. Make sure everything's secured and safe. But these bikes, they're going to be fine all winter long. They're not going to get banged around and damaged. And um, next spring, just going to be able to pull them down and be ready to go. Now, these are the tools I would recommend. First of all, a set of sockets, both standard and metric. Um, you're, on most bicycles, you, you're going to encounter a combination of fasteners. Um, if it's a strictly import bike, probably be all metric, um, but often different parts are made in different countries, and you may encounter uh, a standard size fastener and a combination of metric fasteners. So standard and metric sockets, very important. Um, a set of metric and standard wrenches. And um, I've got an adjustable in there. If you're going to use an adjustable, make sure it is a very high quality adjustable. Um, the particular one right there is an SK brand. Um, it's one of those tools that belonged to my dad and just has always been around. And the jaw, the movable jaw on that wrench is nice and solid. It doesn't wobble. The jaws are flat, no dings in them. Um, and the wheel, the thumb wheel turns very easily with just my thumb. So if I need to use that, I can keep my thumb on that thumb wheel and keep it tight on any fastener that I'm loosening or tightening. And also a ball peen hammer comes in quite handy. Um, extra 10 millimeter wrench. This is kind of a running joke with mechanics of all sorts. You always seem to not have a 10 millimeter when you need it. And everything has 10, mil 10 millimeter fasteners on it. Um, as I found out not too long ago, even Harley Davidson motorcycles have a 10 millimeter fastener on it. I have a friend who's a lifelong Harley mechanic and um, he, he has to keep a 10 millimeter wrench in his toolbox. I believe it's a component of the ignition that is made in Canada and you need a 10 millimeter wrench, but it's probably the most common size fastener in the world. And you will encounter something on your bicycle that needs a 10 millimeter wrench. So if you have an extra one, hang on to it. Screwdrivers. Going to need a set of flat tip and Phillips head screwdrivers. Um, sizes. Sometimes you need great big Phillips heads, but not often. Um, a lot, some older bikes have very large um, Phillips head screws on them. You're probably not going to encounter that too much on um, newer, more modern bicycles. Um, one of my favorite tools to use as a screwdriver is actually that quarter inch socket that is on the right hand side of the photograph. Um, purchased that set at a hardware store down the street from my house many, many years ago. And it just has a small adapter and many different sized screwdriver bits. It is a great tool for getting into tight little fiddly areas where you can't really get a good um, grip on a regular screwdriver. And it's also fantastic for getting um, stubborn or over tightened screws loose because it's very easy to put downward pressure and torque on it at the same time. It's a very handy tool. Also going to need a set of standard and metric Allen wrenches. Most modern bicycles are going to have Allen wrenches on it. Um, that's the hex head screws, and you're, you're definitely going to need a set of Allen wrenches for your bicycle. Now this is the toolkit that I mentioned that was available through my local library. You can see it's got the tire removal tools there and a bunch of other specialty tools for working on bicycles. Now products you use on your bicycle. Um, WD-40 is a great product for cleaning scratchy pots on old guitars. I'm actually not kidding. It, um, it is a great cleaner. It is not a great lubricant. Um, it's not something you want to be spraying on your, your bike chain or your cables. It, uh, it is great for cleaning off corrosion, 
which is why I've used it many times on scratchy uh, pots on electric guitars. Uh, it little squirt, turn the, the control back and forth, and it cleans up the that corrosion, which causes all kinds of scratchy noises on, a, uh, on an electric guitar. Um, products you do want to use. This is what I used on this particular bicycle. Use regular old 409 to do a lot of the cleaning. Um, use some gunk parts degreaser to get that old nasty grease off of um, all of the bearings and the chain. Um, PB Blaster, that is a wonderful penetrating oil for getting rusted fasteners uh, apart. You soak it with that stuff. It, it Fantastic product for getting um, corroded parts loosened. And a can of, I, I use in particular the brand Liquid Wrench Chain and Cable Lubricant. There are many, many different types, um, different brands of chain and cable lubricant. They all work fine. Um, there are specialty products like chain waxes. Um, I've never really used those, never saw the need for them. Um, a inexpensive can of chain and cable lube is pretty much all you need. And I've used that on um, bicycles and motorcycles for years and never had any issues with it. It is a great product for lubricating the, the chains and cables on your bike. Now, like I said before, hopefully your, your bike is not going to be in nearly as bad a shape as this old bicycle was. This bike was abandoned and it was left outside for several years. And I, I got it and was going to use it to, for this demonstration. And then that got delayed and I left it outside for a couple of years. So this poor thing was very neglected. So your bike is probably not going to need nearly the amount of tear down and cleaning and repair that this one did. But what are the minimums that you should do before you put your bike away for winter? Well, you want to check for tire and brake wear. Look at your tires. If you're starting to see cracks on it, it's probably best to go ahead and buy a new set of tires and replace them now. That way they'll be, the bike will be ready to go on the first nice day, day of spring. Check your brake pads, look for any excessive wear and especially uneven wear. If they're worn unevenly, first figure out why are they worn unevenly. Probably they've come loose a little bit. They're just not quite aligned with the rim of the bike where they're supposed to be grabbing. Um, but replace ones that show excessive wear. Check for any loose or missing parts. Go over your bike with those wrenches, make sure everything's tight. Look for anything that's missing, any fasteners that are missing, any reflectors that are missing. Check for corrosion. You want to clean up any corrosion um, on bare metal surfaces. Use that um, quadruple zero steel wool. If you're starting to see corrosion on paint, clean it up as best you can. And then once you get the corrosion cleaned up, wax where that corrosion was to keep it from coming back. Check for wheel trueness. Basically, this just means that when you spin the wheel, it doesn't wobble back and forth. Um, it's possible to adjust trueness, but I'm not going to get into that. It is very fiddly, and it's probably going to save you all kinds of headaches and a lot of time to just take a wobbly wheel into a bike shop where they have a truing stand and get them to true it up. But if your wheel's wobbling back and forth, it probably, you know, it definitely needs to be trued. You don't want to be riding a bike with wobbly wheels. And check for general cleanliness. Clean and wax all painted and chrome parts. Um, a lot of people don't think about waxing their bicycle. You may wax your car, especially if you have a nice car, you're probably out there waxing it all the time. But a nice coat of wax will protect and preserve your bike, keep it from corroding, and just keep it looking so much better for so much longer. Um, also, a nice coat of wax, if you've ever put a nice coat of wax on a car, you know it makes it a lot easier to clean. You're going to want to lubricate your chain and all your cables. And then 
make sure you put your bike away in a safe spot. If it just gets tossed in the corner of the garage, you might bang it with a snowblower or it might get shoved further into a corner. Just get it up out of the way into a nice safe spot where it won't get banged around this winter. Now here's a bicycle that is much more like what you probably have at home, a much more modern bicycle um, and probably a lot closer to the condition of the bicycles that you have at home. This bike looks to be in really good shape. Um, it's got all of its reflectors. It's fairly clean. Um, it's got reflectors on the pedals, on the wheels. Everything's looking pretty good, but let's take a closer look. That frayed cable on that brake is going to savage you when you least expect it, and it's going to feel like you're getting poked with a bunch of little needles. So something needs to be done about that. Also, cat hair does not make a good chain lubricant. So first step, washing the bike. I use simple um, car washing soap and a scrub brush, went over the bike from front to back, top to bottom, cleaned off all the dirt from this bike, um, scrubbed the chain and everything. Um, then I, you go back over it with um, a degreaser and degrease the chain, the derailers, um, and relubricate the, the chain, the derailers, and all of the cables. Um, now that frayed cable, all of the strands were still there for that cable, so it was simply a matter of taking a pair of pliers, twisting all the ends back together, and then crimping on a new ferrule, and that cable will last for quite some time. Now, no matter what type of bike you have, whether it's an old coaster brake bike, like I showed you at the beginning of this video, um, a cruiser bike, um, a road bike, or a high-tech recumbent bike, the principles I've shown you here are gonna be basically the same, and the ideas are gonna be the same. You wanna make sure the bike is clean, waxed, lubricated, um, and that all of its parts are there and that everything is in good condition before you put it away. That way, next spring, the very first nice day, you just need to take the bike out of your safe storage spot and you'll be good to go. Um, I wanna thank you for joining me today. Hopefully we'll have some more nice days where we can enjoy our bicycles this season, but winter's coming, so make sure you get your bicycle prepped before you put it into storage. Thank you again, have a great day. One question I get asked a lot is, do you actually use WD-40 on old guitars? And yes, I do. As a matter of fact, this is a Gibson Melody Maker. This is 57 years old, and the pots were scratchy and making all kinds of noise, and WD-40 worked great to get this so it sounded good again. Now, I mention that not just because I think it's kind of humorous and entertaining, but knowing your products, knowing what they do, what they do well, and what they do poorly is very important. Make sure you know, um, for instance, WD-40, one of the reasons I really like using that is I know it won't damage a finish on an old guitar. If I get it on a table or on the floor, it's slippery, but it's easy to clean up. So know your products before you use them. Know what they're good for, what they're bad for, um, their pros and cons, basically. Make sure you understand each product that you're going to use before you go and use it. The next couple questions I'd like to go over are fairly subjective with the answer. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of things that you'd have to consider to answer these questions. The first question is, how do you determine the size 
for a bicycle? Well, um, if you've bought shoes or clothes for kids, you know that they grow awfully fast. So you need to make sure that there's enough adjustment that you can raise the seat, move the handlebars to make the, the bike rideable for the kid for, for more than one season, if that's your concern. If, um, if you're just going to use a bike for one season, then, then that's not so much of a concern. But a, a basic rule of thumb is the, the top bar of the bicycle, the, the bar that you need to throw your leg over, can be no more than the inseam of your pants. So if you wear a 32-inch length in Levi's, make sure that that top bar is, is below that so that it's – and also – for some people, that may be difficult to throw your leg over something that high. You may want something lower. A lot of newer bikes have a very slanted top bar. They're not like this old bike with a, where they had the very straight top bar, and then the girl's bike had the curved bar where you didn't have to, to raise your leg up because you don't want to be unladylike. Um, anyway, um, so it, it's very subjective. If you've, you've got a bad knee and you can't throw your leg up over um, – uh, a bar, then you want to make sure that that top bar is much lower. Um, but the seat needs to be adjustable enough that you can get to a comfortable riding position. Now, what's a comfortable riding position? Once again, that can be very subjective. Um, uh, the, the road bikes with those curved handlebars, um, the guys lean way over to, to ride those things. Um, if that's a comfortable riding position for you where you're leaned over the, the bars, that's fine. Some people, that may cause stiffness in their back and they don't want to ride that way. You may want bars that, um, handlebars and a seat set so that you sit more in an upright position, kind of like how you would sit in a regular straight back chair. So these are the kind of things, it's, it's, it's hard to have a set hard and fast rule for what's the proper size for a bike. Um, you know, as a parent, you have to determine what size bike you're going to buy for your kid. And that's all about the height. And of course, kids, you know, they don't have a stiff knee or, you know, a bad back. So they don't need to worry about that as much. But you want to make sure that the bike is not too big for the kid. Um, general rule, you want to make sure you can put your feet on the ground. Um, if you feel comfortable only with your feet flat on the ground, then you need to make sure you can put your feet flat on the ground. Me personally, I just need to be able to put my toes on the ground, and that's that's good enough for me. Um, but when you're buying a bike, make sure that there's enough to adjustment so that you can change that. If you If you're looking at a bike and the seat is all the way down and you can barely touch or it doesn't, you know, it's like, oh, I'm not sure this, you know, I could probably, maybe you want to skip that bike and get something with a frame that's a little bit lower. Um, once it's low enough, of course, you can adjust the seat higher and that's no problem. Um, you also want to make sure that the handlebars can be adjusted, um, whether you're turning the handlebars or raising and lowering the, the neck, that stem expander bolt that I showed earlier in the lecture. Um, you can raise and lower that a few inches too, but you want to make sure that it, it's comfortable for you. Um, that general rule where if you're sitting on the seat, you can put your feet flat on the ground or at bare minimum, you know, you're, the balls of your feet firmly on the ground. Um, that's going to be necessary for you to, to ride the bike safely. I, I try to encourage people to, you know, if, if you don't want to go out and spend a bunch of money on a new bike, look around for used bikes. You can find, basically, often you can find people just giving a bike away. Um, but it may have some issues that need to be taken care of. Um, but the first thing you want to look for if you're, if you're purchasing a used bike is the same things. It, can I make the adjustments on this bike so that it's comfortable and safe for me or my kid or my wife or my husband to ride? Um, so you want to make sure that it falls into what your sweet spot is, where you feel comfortable riding. If you feel comfortable riding, leaned over the bars, um, in that racing position, cool. If you need to sit up in a more upright, um, seated position, you need to make sure that that bike is adjustable to that riding position. And also the, the main thing is make sure it's not too high. If the bike is too high, 
uh, you're, you're probably going to topple over getting on or off of that bike. Um, now, other things to look for in buying a used bike. Unfortunately, once again, no hard and fast rule, but you just want to make sure any problems that bike has, are they problems you can solve easily? If it just is completely corroded and you're, you're just like, wow, this thing looks like garbage. Maybe it is garbage. Um, me personally, I've taken rusty frames that were literally buried in a barnyard and repaired those. But that's probably not what you guys are going to want to do. You want something that you can clean up, put air in the tires, maybe change a few parts and be on your way. So check those things. It's just like the things you'd check for on your bicycle before you, you take it out. Make sure the tires are in decent shape. If they're not in decent shape, maybe that's something you're okay with replacing. No big deal. Um, the wear parts, if they're worn, you, you just need to replace them. Look for any kind of cracks. If you see cracks in the paint, there may be cracks in the welds. Um, anywhere the two pipes on that frame meet, look there and look for cracked paint. And if you see cracked paint, it's very possible that there's a crack in that frame. So maybe skip that one. So if you're buying a bike for a kid, honestly, make sure it's something the kid's going to think is cool so that they're like happy about riding it. And, and make sure that all the parts are there. Any parts that look sketchy, you know you can replace straight away. Um, and make sure it fits in that size range. Um, now, basically, rule of thumb, that in, inseam measurement um, that you have on your jeans, make sure the top bar is below that so that you can get your leg over that bar. Um, I've worked on a lot of antique bicycles, so I, I've taken, like I said, I've taken things that were pretty trashed and, and restored them. That's probably not what you guys are going to want to do, so use your own judgment. Be aware of what your skill level is, what your budget is for a bicycle, and try not to go over that. Uh, if, if somebody's giving something away, sometimes it's worth every penny of that free. Um, so just be aware and be careful and don't get yourself involved in something that's going to cost you more than you're really wanting to spend. Um, another question that's kind of associated with looking at used bicycles um, and looking at your own bicycle. How much dry rot, that cracking on the sidewall, is acceptable? Well, the answer to that is pretty much none. Um, if there's any cracking on the sidewall of your tire, it, it's, it's not going to get better, obviously, and it's only going to get worse. So if you see any cracks starting to develop on your tire, if it's towards the end of the season, maybe you can get away with not replacing that tire. I wouldn't recommend that. Um, as soon as you start seeing cracks on the sidewall, you should just head to the bike shop, buy a new tire, um, buy a set of those tire removal tools if you're doing it yourself and, and just swap out the tire. It's, it's not that expensive. Um, depending on the bicycle, some bike tires are, you know, are expensive. Some, um, are, are less just depends. You know, there's a wide variety of bicycles out there. Now, another question I get is what are some common mistakes that a beginner makes working on a bicycle. Well, first and foremost, it's using the wrong size wrench. It's very important that when you're working on, on anything, any um, mechanical device whatsoever, that you use the proper size tool. If you are removing a Phillips head screw and you use a small screwdriver, a small Phillips head to remove a large Phillips head screw, you're going to damage that screw and it's going to make things more difficult. It's going to um, possibly strip out that screw and cause you all kinds of problems. You want to make sure that whatever tool you're using actually fits the fastener very snugly, that it's the proper size. Um, here, here's some pictures of various fasteners, um, a couple various fasteners that um, I'm showing with the wrong size wrench and the right size wrench. You can see here, I've got a metric wrench 
on a standard size uh, hex head bolt. And I might be able to get away with turning this fastener if it's not too tight, but it's going to round the, the corners of this bolt a little bit, even if, even if it seems successful. And then when you go to work on it again, it, it could strip. Now, here's a picture of same fastener with the correct size wrench. And this is very important. You, every old bicycle I've seen has often several fasteners where you can see somebody has taken an adjustable wrench or the wrong size wrench and tightened or loosened the, the fasteners and they're rounded off. And sometimes with bicycles, they, they have, you know, especially the axles have oddball size threads and it's hard to find nuts. You can't find them at your hardware store. You have to go to a bike shop. Um, so make sure that your wrenches fit properly. Here's um, an Allen wrench. Sometimes these are a little harder to tell, but if you look at this one, I've got a, this is a quarter inch socket. That, that's what this fastener needs. And I've got a metric wrench in here and it seems to fit okay, but if you look closely, it doesn't fit quite right. And when I turn this, and I, I don't have a video of this, this is just a still photograph, but when I turn this, I can feel it wobble back and forth. Now here's the same fastener with a correct quarter inch Allen head, and it fits nice and snug. Um, very important that you use the right size wrench. Um, if you don't have the right size wrench, if you're gonna use adjustables, uh, especially if you're having a hard time removing a fastener, don't just run and grab a great big wrench. Um, it, it, it can cause you all kinds of problems. I've got a few sizes of, of adjustable wrenches here. If you're going to use an adjustable wrench, really check and make sure that there is very little or no wobble, especially up and down on that movable jaw on that adjustable wrench. And each turn of that wrench, make sure you're paying attention and that uh, that thumb wheel hasn't come loose and you aren't rounding off that fastener. It's very easy, it's very easy to destroy fasteners with an adjustable wrench. Uh, another common mistake, and th this is a lot on new bicycles. Um, mom and dad go out and buy the kid a, a bicycle uh, picking it up at a department store or ordering it online. It comes in a box. And normally when they pack a bicycle in a box, of course, the handlebars aren't installed. It fits in a box smaller. Well, one of the things they also do is spin the front fork around backwards. And that makes the bicycle take up a little bit less room, maybe an inch or two in the box. Well, you pull the bike out that fork is reversed and they just pop the handlebars on there. Now here's a kid's bike and you can see the front fork is straight. Doesn't look like it would matter much which way you put this fork on, but look at how the handbrake grabs the wheel. That should always be on the outside of the fork, not on the inside. It's possible it, there are so many different designs. It's possible it could work fine forever but it's also possible that something could get jammed up. Um, the, the cable for that brake could bind. Now also, look at this one. This, this little kid's bike has disc brakes, but you can see the front fork pushes outward. And it, it's the little um, welded gusset on the front of this fork where the front tire mounts. If you spin that around backwards, it moves that front tire back maybe an inch and a half. In a lot of ways, so what? But that changes the balance of the bicycle. It moves that front wheel a couple inches back. And this little kid's bike has these great big disc brakes. So the kid's trucking along, trucking along. You've got that fork on there backwards. He tags that front brake, just pulls it really hard, and gets launched right over the handlebars. Um, so it, it changes the balance of the bicycle. 
Um, I was kind of hoping to have uh, a video showing this, but all the bicycles that I own, it's actually impossible to put the fork on backwards. Um, I took that old green bike and um, tried to put the fork on backwards and everything stops it. There's a reflector tab that stops it from being put on backwards. The fender stops it from being put on backwards. But you can see the curve of the fork as I've got it almost turned around backwards here in this photo. That's what I'm talking about. A lot of front forks have, now this one is an extreme curve. You couldn't possibly mistake that this is supposed to face inward. But a lot of forks have a little bit of push that moves that front wheel out a little bit. And remember, any time the fork curves or it's got gussets and it moves the, the wheel away from the fork, that's supposed to be forward. Anytime there's a brake mounted on the front fork, that's supposed to be on the outside of the fork. A um, little bit of a common mistake. If, if you go to pull that bike out of a box, brand new, look at that front fork, look at the pictures of the bike, and make sure that you have it looking exactly like the photograph. Um, and look at the photograph. Sometimes the drawings they put in the uh, assembly instructions are terrible. Um, very often the wording in assembly instructions is just, um, it's literal translation, so it's gobbledygook and makes no sense. So just be careful and check that front fork and make sure it's put on the, the right way. Another question, how old should a kid be before they start working on bikes? I often get such subjective questions. Um, this is one, it, it's, it's, it depends on the kid. Is the kid really mechanically inclined? Who knows? Here's a picture of me at 11 years old, uh, pulling a wheelie on my um, BMX bike. My brother and I had just replaced the front fork on this bicycle and um, I purchased a bunch of pads, uh, actually safety pads. You can see I've got no helmet, but I'm, I'm, I'm worried about those safety pads. Um, so I was 11. My brother would have been 14, 15. And we were, well, first of all, we had uh, destroyed the front fork on this bicycle, jumping it and doing silly things like that, and purchased a new fork and installed it. And um, I had been working on my own bicycles for probably a couple years at this point. Um, but it, it all depends on the kid. I can tell you when I first started working on bikes, I used vice grips or whatever I could. And uh, that's something you never want to do. Um, here's a picture of vice grips on a bolt. Don't use vice grips on anything. Um, if you've got a, a stripped fastener that you're going to remove and throw out, then it's okay to use vice grips. Uh, but don't use vice grips on anything you plan to save. Uh, they're kind of an emergency, last-ditch effort tool. But one thing, any kid doing anything, especially for the first time, they need adult supervision. And you need to make sure that the adult knows what they're doing and is instructing the kid properly. And maybe the kid helps instead of doing it on their own. But this is such a subjective thing. Um, some kids are going to get mechanical things straight away. Some kids, just it, it just isn't going to make sense to them. And they're going to get frustrated and, and want to give up. So adult supervision and see if the kid's enjoying it, if they're getting the concepts of tightening fasteners properly, using the proper size wrench, et cetera. Um, and any age where they show the interest and have the, the ability. So that, that could be anything um, from, from a very small child up to maybe the kid just never wants to work on a bicycle. So I'm, I'm, I'm now asked, what projects are you working on now? Well, this is actually a project that 
I started a long time ago. Here's me when I was 18 years old and I had built a custom made tandem bicycle. I had actually taken a couple of old Schwinn frames that I found on a farm and cut them and welded them together to make this tandem bike and rode this bike for many, many years. And uh, it got kind of put off to the side and neglected and now it, it needs to be rebuilt. And so this is one that I'm hoping to get done uh, this season. I want to rebuild this bike. I'm going to change a few things, modernize a few things on it. And hopefully I will get this uh, down from the garage ceiling and rebuilt and up and running. Well, I want to thank you for joining us. And if you have any questions that I haven't answered, please visit your library. If you're like me, I'm the kind of person who, since I was a kid, if I had a question that I couldn't answer, we didn't have the internet when I was a kid. Um, I love the reference desk at the library. Um, walking up and asking any question, sometimes really odd questions that you wouldn't think of asking a reference librarian, they can get you the answers. They can get you the materials you need to learn just about anything. So go to your local library, ask questions, ask for the materials you need to, to learn how to do anything you want to learn how to do. Your, your library is a, an amazing resource and you can learn literally anything you want to learn by visiting your local library. Thank you again and have a safe and enjoyable writing season. Bye-bye.